Okay, last week. We talked about the critical point issue. Now, I want to tell everyone that. Critical point is not always to be. When you are training a network. The biggest obstacle you confront. Now, in this slide. I want to tell everyone that. There is a technique called adaptive learning rate. That is to say, we want to. Give each parameter a different learning rate. But why did I say that this critical point may not be the biggest obstacle during our training? Usually, when training a network, you will record its loss. So, you will see that your loss is large at first. And, when you keep updating of parameters, here, we use the horizontal axis to represent the times of update. The loss will become smaller and smaller as you update parameters. And finally it is stuck at some point. Stuck, means, your loss no longer reduces. At this time, most people might guess, that it has reached the critical point. Because the gradient is equal to zero. So we can't update the parameters anymore. But, is it true? When we are saying that we have reached the critical point, it means the gradient is very small. But have you ever confirmed? When your loss no longer reduces, the gradient is really that small? In fact, most of you may not confirm this. In this example, I showed today, when our loss no longer reduces, gradient doesn't become very small, actually. The following is the norm of the gradient, which is the vector of the gradient. Since gradient is a vector, the length of the gradient vector changes as the parameters updates. You will find that even though the loss no longer reduces, the norm of this gradient, which is the magnitude of the gradient, may not become very small, actually. In fact, at the end of the final training, the loss hardly moves and decreases, but the gradient suddenly increases. How does it happen? A result like this is actually not hard to guess. Maybe, you are in a situation like this. This is our error surface and your gradient now, is between the two walls of the error surface valley. It oscillates back and forth. At this point, your loss will not reduce anymore. So, seeing this situation, you will feel that, your loss will not get smaller anymore. But, in fact, is it stuck at the critical point? Is it stuck at the saddle point? Is it stuck in the local minima? No. Its gradient is still large. Only the loss may not decrease anymore. So, you have to pay attention to that. When you train a network, in the end of training, you find out. Your loss no longer decreases. Don't just say anything like. Ah, I'm stuck in the local minima. Or I'm stuck at saddle point. Sometimes, neither of them is true. You just encounter a situation where the loss cannot decrease anymore. That's why in homework 2-2, there will be an assignment for everyone. To calculate the norm of the gradient. In order to know that, whether you are now stuck at the saddle point, or critical point, because, in most of the situations, when you say that your training is stuck, few people actually analyze the root cause of it. To give you a strong impression, we have an assignment, for you to analyze, the cause of the training bottleneck. Hence, so far, some students might have a question. If, during the training process, we rarely get stuck at a saddle point, or local minimum. How was this graph produced? Do you remember this graph? Last time we drew this graph to illustrate a scenario where we are training a network. After the training, the current parameters are around the critical point. Then, according to the sign of the eigenvalue, we can then judge whether this critical point is more like a saddle point or a local minimum. If, in practice, it is rather difficult to come to a saddle point, or a local minimum. How is this graph produced? Let me tell you a secret here. If you want to have a result like this, you have to train until your parameters are very close to the critical point. But you can't achieve it. Using the common gradient descend method, the common gradient descend will give you the following result. Your loss will fall, while you still have a big gradient. This requires a special method to train. So after I've done this experiment, I believe that it's actually a difficult task to get to a critical point. Most of the time, before reaching the critical point, the training has stopped. 
However, that doesn't mean that critical point is not a problem. I just want to tell you, as of right now, when you use gradient descend to optimize your model, your true boss, the thing you should really blame for, is often not a critical point, but other reasons. Then why? If the problem was not the critical point, why is our training stuck? Let me give a very simple example. I have a very simple error surface here. We only have two parameters. When the two parameters are different, the value of the loss is different, and we can draw an error surface. The lowest point of this error surface is at this x. In fact, this error surface is convex. If you don't know what convex is, it doesn't matter. In short, its contour is elliptical. It's just that on the horizontal axis, the gradient is very small. The change of the slope is very little. It's very smooth. So the major axis of this ellipse is very long, while the minor axis is relatively short. The gradient varies greatly on the vertical axis. The slope of the error surface is very steep. Now, we start from this point. We take this point as the starting point and do gradient descend. You might think it's not so difficult to do gradient descend on this convex error surface. Just slide down all the way and maybe walk over here. It should be very easy. If you try it yourself, you will find that even on a convex error surface, as simple as this one, gradient descent won't necessarily yield a great result. For example, this is the result I got from trying it myself when the learning rate is set to 10 to the power of minus 2. My parameters were caught between the two cliffs of a canyon. Try to imagine this side as a cliff and imagine the other side, which is outside of this graph, as another cliff. My parameters are constantly oscillating between the two cliffs. I can't lower my loss, even if the gradient is still very large. You might say that it's because the learning rate is too high. The learning rate determines the step size when updating the parameters. If the learning rate is set too high, the step size is going to be too large. This way, we won't be able to reach the bottom of the canyon. Lowering the learning rate should easily solve this problem, right? Not really. When you try to adjust the learning rate, you will find that doing training on a convex optimization problem like this is actually a very tedious process. The process is quite painful and exhausting. I tried out some learning rates from 10 to the power of minus 2 all the way to 10 to the power of minus 7. After adjusting it to 10 to the power of minus 7, it finally stopped oscillating. We slid down the slope, reached the bottom of the valley, and finally turned left. But you can see that this training will never reach the goal. How come? The reason is that the learning rate is too low. On this slope, we can still update the parameters. Because of the steep slope, which provides a large gradient. However, the slope becomes very smooth at the bottom of the canyon. This stops us from doing further training, since we set the learning rate too small. In fact, this spot that is covered with black dots contains 100,000 dots. There are 100,000 dots here, with more than 100,000 updates, which is by no means a small number. It still fails to get to the local minima. This shows that even a convex error surface is hard to train with gradient descent. Some of you might want to say that there must be better ways to solve the convex optimization problem other than gradient descent, which is a relatively primitive method. There are indeed other methods. But think about it. If someday we have a more complicated error surface, the only tool we can rely on to help us train a deep network is gradient descent. However, our only tool can't even perform well on a simple error surface. How can we trust it when we have a more complicated error surface? Right? We can't expect it to perform well on harder tasks when it can't even solve this simple problem. That's why we need an improved version of gradient descent. How can we make gradient descent perform better? In the old version of gradient descent, all parameters have the same learning rate. Obviously, this is not enough. 
Every parameter should have a customized learning rate. So now we are going to talk about how to customize the learning rates. How to do this? How do we customize the learning rate? What kind of learning rate do we actually need for different parameters? From the previous example, we can see a fundamental principle. The principle is that if the value of our gradient is very small in one direction, which means it is very flat in one direction, then we would like to increase the learning rate. If it is very steep in a certain direction, that is, a steep slope in one direction, then we actually expect that the learning rate can be set smaller. How to automatically adjust the learning rate based on the size of this gradient? We need to change the original formula for gradient descent. Here later, while we explain it, we only put the updated formula for a certain parameter. Before, when we were talking about gradient descent, we often talked about the updated formula for all parameters. Here, in order to simplify this problem, we only look at one parameter. But you can generalize this method to all parameters. We only look at one parameter now. This parameter is called theta i. For the value of this theta i in the teeth iteration, we subtract the gradient calculated by this parameter i in the teeth iteration from it. This GIT represents the differentiation of parameter theta i to loss in the teeth iteration. That is, when theta is equal to theta t, we subtract the learning rate from this theta i t and multiply it by GIT. This will update the learning rate to theta i t plus 1. This is our original gradient descent. Our learning rate is fixed. Now we want to have a customized learning rate. A learning rate that is tailored according to the parameter. How do we do this? We change the original learning rate eta to eta divided by sigma i t. You find that this sigma i t has a superscript t and a subscript i. This means that the parameter sigma depends on i. In short, it is parameter dependent. We have to give a specific sigma according to the targeted parameters. At the same time, it is also iteration dependent. We will have a different sigma for different iterations. So when we change our learning rate from eta to eta divided by sigma i t, we have a parameter dependent learning rate. Next, we are going to look at the common calculation methods of the parameter dependent learning rate. What kind of method do we use to calculate the sigma? A common type is to count the root mean square of the gradient. What does that mean? This is the formula. The parameter is going to update. We start from theta i0. Later we won't read the i out. Since everyone knows what I mean. Here we consider a certain parameter. So there is a subscript i. But later, for the convenience of teaching. I won't read the i out. Subtract the initial parameters theta 0 by. G0 multiplied by the learning rate eta and divided by sigma 0. To get theta 1. How is this sigma 0 calculated? In the first update of the parameter, this sigma 0 is the square root of g0 squared. This g0 is our gradient. It is the square root of the square of the gradient. What about this one? It's actually the absolute value of g0, right? So putting the absolute value of g0 here, this g0 and this g0 actually have the same magnitude. So in the first iteration, this term is either 1 or minus 1. In other words, during the first iteration, when we update it from theta 0 to theta 1, we either add eta or subtract eta. It has nothing to do with the norm of the gradient. It only depends on the value of eta. This is the first iteration. This iteration is not very important, though. So if you can't quite understand it, it's fine. What are going to do next is more important. For theta 1. We should subtract g1 multiplied by eta divided by sigma1 from it. Note that in the second iteration, we divide by sigma1, not sigma0. But how is sigma1 actually calculated? Sigma1 is calculated from all the gradient vectors in the past. We take the root mean square of them. So, in the first iteration, we've calculated g0. During the second iteration, we calculated g1. 
Thus sigma 1 is the square root of g0 square plus g1 square, divided by 2. This is what, root mean square, means. After we finished calculating sigma 1, the learning rate is eta divided by sigma 1. Subtract the learning rate times g1 from theta 1. We obtain theta 2. Then following the same process. For the third iteration, you subtract theta 2 by eta divided by sigma 2 multiplied by g2. In this iteration, sigma, or sigma 2, is the root mean square of all the gradients in the past. So you should take the square root of g0 square plus g1 square plus g2 square and divided by 3. Substitute what you've got into sigma 2 and finish the third iteration. We just keep repeating the same process. When the parameter is updated for the teeth time. Well, actually the t plus oneth time. When the parameter is updated for the t plus oneth time. How do you calculate sigma t? Well, the answer is still the same. It is simply the root mean square of all gradients. That is, from g0 to gt. Then, divide it by eta, and use this whole thing as the learning rate, for the current iteration. This trick is actually used in an algorithm called Adagrad. You may ask, why does this trick work? Or, why can this trick accomplish what we wanted to do? When the slope is relatively large, we want the learning rate decreases by itself, and vice versa? Imagine we have two parameters. One is theta1, and the other one is theta2. Theta1 has a small slope while theta2 has a large slope. Because of theta1 small slope, the gradients of the parameter theta1 are relatively small. Because the gradients are relatively small, the sigma, which is the root mean square of the gradients, is also small. If sigma is small, the learning rate will be large. On the other hand, theta2 is a relatively steep parameter. The loss is more sensitive to the changes in the direction of theta2. So the gradients are relatively large. If the gradient is relatively large, its sigma is bigger, and, as a result, the update of the parameters in one iteration becomes smaller. So, with the sigma term, you can adjust the learning rate automatically, according to the information from the each parameter's gradient. This is not the ultimate version you will use nowadays. What are the problems with that version? Even if the parameters are the same, the learning rate it needs will still change over time. It assume that each of the gradient size of the same parameters will have similar value within a small range. But in fact, it doesn't have to be like this. For example, let's take a look at this crescent-shaped error surface. If we consider the horizontal axis, or, in other words, consider the direction of the horizontal line, you will find that the slope is relatively smooth in this place. And the slope is steeper in this place. Therefore, we need a relatively small learning rate. But when it comes to the middle section, the slope has become smooth again. The slope here is steeper, and the slope of this side is smoother. So in this place, we need a relatively large learning rate. Even if there are the same parameters in the same direction, we also look forward to dynamically adjusting the learning rate. So, how to do it? There is a new trick, called RMS prop. The RMS prop method is a bit legendary. It's so special that you can't find in a paper. Where this method comes from. Many many years ago, about 10 years ago, Hinton had a deep learning course on Coursera. In his course, he talked about the RMS prop method. And there is no paper for this method. So, if you want to cite the method, you need to cite the link to the video. This legendary method is called RMS prop. So, how does RMS prop work? The first step is the same as just mentioned. To calculate root mean square, which is the same as the eta grad method. They are the same. So, we don't look at the first step. We move on to the second step. What's the difference in the second step? It still needs to calculate sigma 1. But the way we calculate sigma 1 is different from the way when calculating root mean square. 
When we calculate root mean square, every gradient is equally important. But in RMS prop, it allows you to adjust the importance of the current gradient by yourself. In RMS prop, our sigma 1 is the same as the previous sigma 0. And it already contains G0 in the sigma 0 calculated in the previous step. The sigma 0 represents the size of G0. That is, it is, sigma 0, squared, multiplied by alpha, and then add 1 minus alpha, multiplied by G1, which is the gradient we just calculated. The alpha is another hyperparameter. Just like the learning rate, you have to adjust it by yourself. It is a hyperparameter. You have to adjust it by yourself. You can imagine, if I set alpha to be very close to zero, it means that I think G1 is more important than the gradient calculated earlier. If I set alpha to be very close to 1, it means I think the G1 is less important than the gradient calculated earlier. When updating parameters for the third time, we have to calculate sigma 2. How to do it? We take sigma 1 out, take the square of it, and multiply it by alpha. There is G1 and sigma 0 in sigma 1, and there is G0 in sigma 0. You know that there is G1 and G0 in sigma 1. G1 and G0 will be multiplied by alpha. Add 1 minus alpha multiplied by G2, squared. Therefore, this alpha will control the influence of G2 in the whole sigma 2. The same process will continue over and over again. Sigma it is equal to the square root of alpha multiplied by sigma it minus 1 squared plus 1 minus alpha times git square. You use alpha to determine the importance of git. Okay, this is RMS prop. For RMS prop, you can use alpha to determine the importance of git. Coma paired to those values from git to git minus 1 in sigma it minus 1. If you use RMS prop, you can adjust sigma dynamically. Let's start from this place. And this black line is our error surface. From this place you want to update the parameters. You go from here to here. Because it's very flat along the way. G will be very small. This means that. Sigma will also be very small. If sigma is small, it means. We will take a bigger step. When updating the parameters. Then, we keep going. After reaching here, the gradient becomes larger. Adagrad has a slower response. Compared to RMS prop. But if you use RMS prop. And you set alpha smaller. You just. Make those recent gradients have bigger impact. Then you can increase the value of sigma in a short time. It can make your steps smaller simultaneously. It's like a break. If you come across. A very steep slope suddenly. RMS prop will quickly pull the break to. Make the learning rate smaller. If you didn't do so, the learning rate is too large when you go here. In the meantime, the gradient is very large as well. Multiplying two big values will make you even further from your destination. If you keep moving and go to a level area again, you can adjust alpha to make the sigma it emphasize on the recent calculated gradient. So as long as the gradient becomes smaller, Sigma may react quickly, and its value becomes smaller. Therefore, the steps become larger. This is RMS prop. The optimization strategy is also called the optimizer. Nowadays, the most common optimization strategy is Atom. What is Atom? Atom is RMS prop plus momentum, which we have talked about last week. Here is Atom's algorithm and the paper's link. We won't go into the details. You may worry that you still don't know how to use Atom. Don't worry. PyTorch. Do all the dirty works for you. Or you can search Atom. In teaching assistance code, there must be a function about Atom. So, don't worry about the optimization problem. These deep learning kits usually do it for us. Note that in these optimizers, there are also some parameters need to be adjusted. There are some hyperparameters need to choose manually. But in most cases, the default values are good enough. If you tune it yourself, it becomes worse sometimes. Usually, just use Atom in PyTorch directly. 
and do not modify those default hyperparameters, and you can obtain good results. The details about Adam are left for everyone to study. We just talked about we can't even train on this simple error surface. Now let's take a look at whether we can train or not. After using the adaptive learning rate, the method used here is the most primitive Adagrad method. The sigma is simply calculated by taking the root mean square of all the gradients seen in the past. How is the result? The result looks like this. Ignore this part first. You must be surprised and wonder what is going on when seeing this part. What is going on in this black area? Don't worry about it for now. You have no problem walking down here and then turn left in this turning left part. We updated 100,000 times in the previous version. And we also updated 100,000 times here. In the previous version, we updated 100,000 times. But are stuck in this place. After using Adagrod, you can keep on going. To a point very close to the end. Why can we keep going when using Adagrod? When you come to this place. The gradient along in the left or right direction. Is very small. The learning rate will be adjusted automatically. The learning rate along the left and right direction will automatically become larger. So you can increase the step size and keep on going. The next question is, why does it explode? When I get here, when we are calculating the sigma, we take the mean of all the gradients we have seen in the past. The direction along the vertical axis get a large gradient in the initial position, but get a very small gradient after a long walk. To here. So the direction along the vertical axis accumulates a small sigma. Since we see a lot of small gradients along the y axis, we have accumulated a small sigma. After accumulating for a while, the step became very large and it exploded. However, it's okay even if it explodes because there is a way to fix it. After it exploded, it came to a place with a relatively large gradient and the sigma gradually increases. After sigma increases, the step size of update will become smaller. You will find that it will suddenly explode to the left or to the right. However, it will not explode all the times. The situation of exploding will gradually decrease due to the friction. Eventually, it will go back to the middle part. But after a period of time, it will explode again and then come back slowly. There is a potential way to solve this problem. It is called, learning rate scheduling. What is learning rate scheduling? We have a term eta here. And it used to be a fixed value. Learning rate scheduling means that. The eta is associated with time. We don't treat it as a constant. But associate it with time. How do we make the learning rate time varying? The most common strategy is learning rate decay. Which means, as training proceeds. Namely, as parameters are updated, we gradually reduce a to s value. It's more sensible to do so. Why? Why should the learning rate be decayed? Because we are far from the optimal point at the beginning of training. As training proceeds, we are getting closer and closer to our goal. We have to pull the brakes on the learning rate by gradually decreasing its value so as to slow down the parameter updating. So in this case, the solution should be learning rate decay. After applying learning rate decay, we can reach the destination smoothly. As in this graph, the eta will be very small near the end of training. In the original case, the gradient fluctuates near the destination. After multiplied by a small eta, the gradient is smooth towards the destination. Apart from learning rate decay, there is another classic and very common method of doing learning rate scheduling, called warm-up. I was wondering, if we have to talk about it today, since we have one BERT related homework, where warm-up is required, for decent performance, we still, have to talk about it today. The idea of warm-up, may seem a little bit confusing. Warm-up means that, the learning rate will, be increasing at first and start decreasing at some point. What's the upper bound of the learning rate? And what are the rates of increasing and decreasing? They are hyperparameters. You have to tune them by yourself. 
but the general concept of this method is that the learning rate must increase first and then decrease. This sounds amazing. It's a black technology. It's been introduced in some papers back in ancient times. The warm-up method gains popularity recently because it's common in training BERT. However, it's not introduced later than BERT. It exists since ancient times. For example, warm-up has been used in residual networks. Here's the link to the residual network paper on archive. Nowadays, the machine learning research papers will usually be published on archive first before submitted to international conferences or journals. The papers become more accessible in this way. Take a look at this link and you will know the paper's date of submission among the first four digits of this link. The 15 represents the year, which means that the paper of residual network was submitted to archive in 2015. The last two digits represent the month on the other hand, so it was submitted in December 2015. It's published five years ago. By the end of 2015, in the rapidly evolving field of deep learning, a time span of five years is like a millennium. In the ancient times, the paper of residual network has already introduced the warm-up method. It said that they used a learning rate of 0.01 and then apply warm-up. First, set the learning rate to 0.01 and then change it to 0.1. In the past, the most typical method of learning rate scheduling is to decrease the learning rate gradually. But the residual network, specifically noted in the paper, does the opposite. It sets 0.01 in the beginning then 0.1 afterward. It also added a special note. In the beginning, using 0.1 is not good for training. We don't know why and the paper didn't explain that. Anyway, we need the black technology of warm-up. And this black technology can also be seen in the well-known transformer. I believe many students may have heard of transformer. This course will also talk about transformer. This black technology can also be seen in transformer and the paper mentioned it in a formula. It has a formula here that says its learning rate complies with this magic function. Its learning rate schedule is based on this magical function. At first glance, you might feel like wow. What does that mean? You can try to plot this function. If you plot the equation, you will find that it is actually the warm-up. The learning rate will increase first and then decrease again. So you discover that the technique of warm-up is usually included in many well-known networks, and it is regarded as a black technology. It's not explained in the paper that, why do we use this, but secretly in a small place which you didn't notice, it will tell you. This network needs to use this black technology to train it. Then why do we need warm-up? This is still an open question today. I don't think the reason why warm-up is needed has been completely answered. But one possible explanation here is to think that when we are using Atom, RMS prop, or Ada grad, we will need to calculate sigma. How did this sigma come from? It is a statistical result, right? It tells us how steep or how smooth is a certain direction. The result of this statistic is more accurate. After seeing enough data, so in the beginning, our statistics are inaccurate. And our sigma is not accurate. So we don't want our parameters to be far from the original ones. Let them be in the initial state first and do something like exploration. So the reason that the learning rate is relatively small in the beginning is to let it explore and collect some information about the error surface and statistical data about sigma first. After sigma becomes more accurate, we gradually increase the learning rate. This is a possible explanation of why we need the technique of warm-up. Then if you want to learn more about warm-up, you can read a paper. It is an advanced version of Atom called R Atom. There is more understanding about warm-up in the paper. As for the optimization part, we will stop here. So we started from the vanilla gradient descent and evolved to this version. And what's in this version? The first one is momentum. In other words, we are not completely following the direction of the gradient now. We are not completely following the calculated gradient direction in the current stage. 
to update parameters. Instead, we sum all the previous calculated gradient directions as the direction of update. This is momentum. How big should we be updated next? We need to divide. The root means square of the gradient. When it comes to this, some students may feel very confused. This momentum is to consider all past gradients. This sigma also considers all past gradients. One in the numerator and one in the denominator. Consider all past gradients. Isn't it just cancel out? But in fact, this momentum and this sigma use all the previous gradients in different manners. Momentum is to directly add up all the gradients. So it takes the directions into consideration. It considers the sign of the gradient. It considers whether the direction of the gradient is left or right. But this root mean square does not consider the direction of the gradient. It only considers the magnitude of the gradient. Do you remember when we were calculating sigma? We all have to take the square term. We have to take the square of the gradient. We are adding up the results of the squared results. So we only consider the magnitude of the gradient, regardless of its direction. So the calculated results of momentum and this sigma will not cancel each other out. Okay then, in the end, we also add scheduling of learning rate. This is the complete version of optimization today. However, this optimizer, besides Atom, which is probably the most common optimizer nowadays, there are many variants of this optimizer. But in fact, all kinds of variations either use a different method to count M, or use a different method to calculate sigma, or use different learning rate scheduling. Then if you want to know more things about optimization, there are videos recorded by teaching assistants before. For your reference here, the video is about two hours long. You can know more about optimizer. In fact, there is still a lot to can be discussed. So we won't talk about it here. What have we been talking about so far? We said that when our error surface is very rugged, as rugged as in this example, we need some better methods to do optimization. There is a mountain in front of us. We hope we can bypass that mountain. It's like, I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. You know this gradient and the strange error surface are very annoying, right? Then what will happen next? Next is to use Shenluo Tianzheng to blast this mountain flat. So the techniques we will talk about next is that. Is it possible to flatten this error surface directly? By changing something in the network, such as changing the network architecture, activation function, or something else to flatten the error surface directly to make it easier to train. That is, just directly shovel the mountain that stands in front of us.